My name is Sarah Dallas. I'm the Director of Development and Public Affairs here at the MDR BioLab, and we are very excited to have this evening uh, the president of the laboratory, Dr. Herman Hauer, give a presentation called uh, The Art and Science of, of the Fine Art of Medical Diagnosis. <laughs> um, some of you obviously may know Dr. Hauer for his interest in medicine, for his um, interest in science. He's a nephrologist, so he specializes in understanding the kidney and how our kidneys function. But his passion is in art. So in addition to his degree in chemistry and his, his medical degree, he also has a degree in um, art history. So this is something that he's very passionate about and has a number of lectures that he has put together over the years. So tonight you're going to get a sample of um, what he uses in teaching medical students in Germany at, the, at Hanover uh, Medical School. So we're very excited to have him. He has a long uh, history with the MDI Biological Laboratory and is celebrating his first year as our president. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sherry, for the, uh, the very kind uh, invitation. First of all, I have to tell you, uh, we shouldn't be here. Uh, we should actually be together at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston or somewhere else where we could stand in front of the paintings and have a look at that. Because this is what you see here, and all of you have recognized Mona Lisa, is, well, some sort of reproduction. And when we go into these paintings, uh, I will apologize right now, the reproduction is always not as good as what one can see on the painting. Number two is here you see me in action. Uh, when I started this, it was because of art history, but I was also at the time Dean of Medical Education at our institution, and we had changed our whole system. And while going through all the literature, I came upon publications, first from Yale, that's about 30 years ago, where a professor of medicine took actually the student and went to the museum. Now New Haven, that's, you know, well, it's a nice museum, but there are not that many famous paintings there. But then Harvard picked this up, and they went to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and they trained students to look at paintings. Because when you want to make a diagnosis, this is cross, I know, you have to look and watch. This is what doctors do. You know, they look at patients, or they look at these things, they look at this. The serious art historians of medicine are pathologists. You know, because they look through the microscope here and there, and then they write reports which are basically art history. Some of them claim that it has to do with medical diagnosis and it has to do uh, with real explanations, but they describe what they see. The most famous doctor who could make a diagnosis just by looking at a patient within minutes was Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and so, so did you who remember, you know, some of the stories, I mean, somebody walking into his office and uh, he could say, well, you have been to Afghanistan and I can see this from the color of the skin and you have a little limb, so you must be a soldier and because you are not totally uh, in this condition, you're a sergeant and you're not an officer and uh, this was all five years ago and you have a problem because you look more sorrowful that's medical diagnosis. That's what doctors expect from, uh, what patients uh, expect from a doctor that they can describe this. So I used this information from Yale and Harvard and I started a course at uh, Hanover Medical School where we uh, look not only at paintings and uh, the students had to describe the paintings but we made it a little bit more colorful and we use paintings where with diseases on them. Now that's relatively easy. You know, you look at a Picasso 
And uh, you have green faces, and uh, you say, well, that's a severe form uh, of biliary uh, cirrhosis. That's not what I mean. Or you have these literally thousands of ladies on uh, paintings in the Baroque era, and they all are courageous, and they are all anemic. So that's not the type of diagnosis, but a diagnosis where you can actually have a chance of making a serious diagnosis. So this is what uh, we are using. You can see some examples. That's the most famous example. You know, this nose from Perugino. <laughs> Almost all of you know this painting. We're not going to talk about that. Although it's a fascinating story, especially with the old face and the young face. You know what the disease is? Rosacea. No. You know the most famous U.S. person who has Rosacea? Bill Clinton. Very good. <laughs> Not that form, but you can imagine that. And we could talk about this a lot because we could describe it, the different forms of Rosacea. We could talk about uh, what's the cause of the disease. Actually, we don't know. It may be little animals living in the nose. It may be a T-cell mediated disease. It may be a fungus, to be honest, we don't know. So this could be a lecture uh, by itself. And uh, there are others you can see here. This is the famous Rembrandt painting with the anatomy by Dr. Tobe. Uh, and some of them you will see during the talk. There is something else we have to think about when we one, when we're looking at paintings, and this is, we need realism. You can see this here. I mean, these tears, not all of them, unfortunately, I know about the limitations of that. But here you can see tears, and here we have to have a realistic representation of what's there. And when you think about art history, we have this only for about 500 years. Before that, we had paintings like this, Madonna, Byzantine. You can't make a differential diagnosis out of something like this. They may vary, but this is more a type. And then you have here a very nice expressionist painting, but I already, already mentioned this, when you have a blue face, uh, it's uh, asphyxia or not enough oxygen, but it's very difficult to do this from expressionist paintings. So really it starts here at around 1350 and then it runs to the end of the 19th century. This is what we use as material. I'll show you a very nice example of what I mean when I uh, talk about Realis realism. This is Chotto, one of the most famous or the first Renaissance painter. And you can not only appreciate that these figures here are all of a sudden have a volume and every art history book tells you uh, about this. But when you look more closely, you have here all these angels. This is a very serious event. So uh, St. Mary is going to heaven. And these two angels here in the last row, as always, they chat. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, you know, shows very clearly. I mean, somebody has experienced normal real life and putting this into paintings. So this is what we want to look at. And we now go through a couple of examples. And the first example is actually not uh, Italy. Not Renaissance, but the first example is Burgundy. We are here in Maine. Burgundy is not only far away in terms of it's in the middle of Europe, but also temporarily. I mean, the Duchy of Burgundy disappeared in the 1500s. But nonetheless, we all know about Burgundy because Burgundy is the place where all the knights in shining armor come from. You know, chivalry, all these stories about fair ladies and knights fighting for them. This is all Burgundy. So, a very important place with a very strong history. And here you see a famous painting that's the Arnolfini Wedding by Jan van Eyck. And this is how it started. 
all of a sudden, beginning of the 15th century, Jan van Eyck, who was painted to the court, Burgundy used this realism and replaced <clears throat> the gold and replaced other more famous colors, which were dear and expensive at the time. And this is our first painting. So as I said, it's more difficult to see, but here you see a very realistic Madonna, and this is called the Madonna van der Pele, because this is Mr. van der Pele, and he is kneeling there, and you can appreciate uh, how vain Jan van Eyck was. There is actually a portrait by himself in the National Gallery in London, and it says, this is me. That's for the first time ever that a painter painted himself and just said, this is me. <laughs> and here you can see the armor, for instance, here the reflections. You can see why he was so <clears throat> well appreciated at court. Now here you see van der Pelen, and you all can see, I think even from the back row, I see a medical problem. Well, if you consider glasses a medical problem, he definitely has glasses. But when you look more carefully, and I'll enlarge this, you can see this is very realistic. And then for a medical doctor, this here. That's the temporal artery. You can see this here. And the temporal artery is enlarged. Now, some of you may start feeling, you know, what about my turn? <laughs> it's a sign, doesn't have to, of inflammation of the temporal artery. So, <clears throat> depicting this here, and I don't think that the loss of eyesight has something to do with it, but it's an association, so we can say <clears throat> this is a prominent temporal artery, and perhaps a sign of inflammation of the artery. And then we can, and that's what we do in these seminars, we can go on and look actually what an artery like this looks like. So if young van, der, van Eyck would have punctured the artery of uh, Mr. van der Feele, perhaps if he would have a microscope, which was only invented 300 years later, he could have perhaps seen something like this. But you can see, when you look at the next one, that this became a topos. This is now Italy. This is about uh, 40 years later, 50 years later, and this is a composer from the famous uh, San Gallo family. Giuliano de San Gallo was one of the first architects of the Vatican, of uh, uh, St. Peter's there. And that's uh, another member of the family you can see it very prominently. So if you walk into a doctor's office with such a temporal artery, the doctor will look at your sedimentation rate and look at inflammatory markers, and uh, medical students should recognize this. So I think that's a valid tool, you know, after you've seen these two paintings. Most medical students will remember temporal artery and enlargement of for some time. So this is introduction. Yes. What about the ears? Are those the, the cauliflower ears? Yeah. You know, the boxing or no? Yeah, well, it could be. You know, Florence at that time was a violent city. You didn't go out at night because there were brawls. And uh, so it could have been, it's definitely not boxing, like from a regular boxing experience, because at the time this was not really used. But it could be, that's a very nice observation, that the ears, but it could also be that it's only because of the cat, you know, because the cat is pushed down and the ears are pushed forward. So, but this is what we want to achieve when we use these paintings for medical students and for education. Now let's look at our first serious patient. Yeah, that's a patient. I mean, yeah, that's, that's for ER. No, I mean, this patient is, uh, there is a problem. 
So what do you think this patient, what's the problem of the patient, or let's better say the problems of the patient? Well, you know, this is now first totally mistake. If you're not Sherlock Holmes, uh, you better not start with a diagnosis which is already so limited. I mean, just be a little bit more careful and would say, well, I mean, <laughs> he's, the patient is in pain. Then you're safe, you know, bubonic plague, I can tell you has not been bubonic plague. And this makes it now, but the patient is in pain. If you look here, the patient is tearing out any pieces of pages from the book. And the head is thrown backwards and enemy. I mean, this is really painful. And I can tell it's important for the diagnosis. What else is wrong with the patient? So that's so what's what let's the abdomen well the abdomen is what uh, medical doctors would call ascites so there's accumulation of fluid in the abdomen we have alteration of the skin now the alterations of the skin are always difficult now because dermatologists are also art historians because what they do is they describe the lesions and they try to be uh, as uh, scientific as possible. Uh, so there are <coughs> red spotches, there are open wounds, we can see that. What about the extremities? Somebody mentioned <coughs> extremities? <coughs> hmm? <coughs> yeah. So what are, how, what is the color of these? Uh, hmm? It's almost black. It's bluish. And then the feet are wet. Uh, this, these are frog feet, aren't they? <laughs> so what are frog feet? If you have feet like a frog, how do they feel? They're cold. And if you look at these extremities, and they are almost like charcoal, this means there is not a lot of circulation in these limbs. Okay. And they are cold. So what the patient has is ascites, an agony, open wounds, and uh, the feet have a livid color, uh, not a livid color, and they are wet, indicating uh, cold feet. And that's the disease. What else can you see on this small part of the painting? You can see this animal here. What's that? Well, we, I've never seen something like this, and I think most of you have never seen something like this. So I think it's a hallucination. I can say this because I know the diagnosis. <laughs> we'll come to this in a moment. First of all, where does this come from? And this is also something which we do in these lectures, that you have to understand the background. When we're talking about this soldier from Afghanistan, Sherlock Holmes, you have to understand that there was a war going on in Afghanistan where the Brits were in war. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to say to somebody, well, you come in here with a sunburned face. So we have to understand background as well. And this is the altar and the church where it stands right now, where this painting is from. It's very famous. It's uh, a little bit south of Strasbourg. A little town called Colmar. And some of you may have been there and perhaps you didn't go to Colmar because the only thing which is really worth looking at in Colmar is a very nice small town and this painting. It's a world, it's a world famous author. It's one of the incunables of uh, German Renaissance painting. It's by a painter we don't know a lot about him. It's called Kuhnewald. We knew that he was very good in building chimneys, besides painting. Uh, he was paid for drilling wells, uh, and he did only a couple of paintings. There are not more than 10, 15 paintings still from Kuhnewald. And this altar, you can see this here, is the most famous one. I'll go quickly through this admirable piece of art. <laughs> We don't know anything about his pupils. We know that he spent in this town about six months. 
So it was paid well. We have still the bills for that. But how he actually developed this, and then when you open the altar, it's like this. Beautiful. Well, it was a trip. And then when you open it once more, and this is only uh, on festivities, you can see here, it's our patient. Uh, oh. And now all of a sudden you see that this whole panel is full of terrible creatures. I'm, as I said, I'm very sorry. We should now all be in Colma and we could go a little bit nearer to the altar and have a look at that. I'll make this a little bit bigger here so you can see here. <coughs> the scene which is displayed here is St. Anthony. And the whole story here, you see St. Anthony again, and the whole altar is about St. Anthony, and I'll come to this in a moment why this is important. And here you have, it's a nightmare, isn't it? I mean, you look at this for more than 20 minutes, and you know what you're going to dream about tonight. <laughs> I looked at this as a kid, you know, because it's so famous in Germany, and I vividly remember this bird here, you know, with a terrible. <laughs> so uh, they are tearing apart St. Anthony. There is uh, uh, the Savior is coming in a moment and take care, uh, will take care of these. But uh, this is our patient. And the question is what disease does our patient have? The patient is in agony. What is the problem? Diagnosis. And actually, we have a description of the disease, and the description is almost a thousand years old. <coughs> so the intestines eaten up by the force of St. Anthony's fire with ravaged limbs, blackened like charcoal, either they die miserably or they live more miserably, seeing their feet and hands develop gangrene and separate from the rest of the body, and they suffer muscular spasms, in hallucinations that deform them. Beautiful. That's pretty good for 1098. <laughs> and imagine the painting was done more than 300 years later. I won't keep you any longer. It's uh, intoxication. The word in German is a very nice word. It's called Mitochondriengiftung. You don't have uh, to re <coughs> remember that, but it's ergotism. And what it comes from is from a fungus which grows with rye, and then when you harvest it, and you have these fungi, fungi in there, and you eat them, or you make bread out of rye, then you will have the disease. So you may imagine this was a disease of the poor because they were crawling through the fields after the rye had been harvested and they were looking for what's left. And the fungus grows when uh, there is uh, wet weather. So in years, when there was a lot of rain and uh, not a lot to eat, then quite a few people were suffering from ergotism. Uh, we'll come to this in a moment, but it's a good question, you know. I mean, the hallucinations you have seen, you, you recognize this in a moment. I'm sure I've taken I think you did, but we'll come to this. <laughs> So this is not very nice because next time you go to a museum and there is Renaissance art, this is from Hieronymus Bosch, and you and this is from Peter Preuger. So you may have thought, you know, I'm sure, I mean Middle Ages, I mean everybody there are swords around and they cut off the feet and uh, this was just warfare. It's not. All these peasants you see without hands and feet are mutilated on these paintings. This is all ergotism. So for a very long time, for hundreds of years, this was a ravaging disease in all of Europe. So why in this church? 
And no, I didn't tell you, the church is St. Anthony's Church. <laughs> and St. The Antonites, you can see here, this is, these are the hospital brothers of St. Anthony. They were founded in uh, 1095. And here you see very nicely, this is one of the brothers of St. Anthony. And here you see what it feels like when you have Anthony's fire in your hand. And you can see here all the extremities hanging from the wall. And here you see the same thing. Here you see a pig, which is very nice because this is how they finance themselves. Uh, pigs were donated when they were born, and then a year later they went to the Brotherhood, uh, and they were marked with uh, the sign of the Brotherhood for the year. And they became very rich. These are the hospitals they were running through Europe. They were founded in France. In 1300, they had 42 hospitals, in 1450, they had 266 hospitals all over Europe centrally, centrally organized. Davita doesn't get there. I mean, all the chains we have today, you know, are much smaller. So imagine 500 years ago, there was a central organization in Europe running 266 hospitals with all the same rules, a financial system, and seeing patients. You wouldn't have solved that. And most of my medical students would have solved this when we talk about this because they think 500 years ago, you know, I mean, you were happy enough if you could find a roof over your uh, uh, head, but you can see that they were pretty well over. And it was common. This is a very nice painting uh, of Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs> The temptation of St. Anthony, also these creatures here. And in the middle of it, that's very hard to see, there is this one patient sitting, looking, you can't see this, at his foot. This is an amputated foot. What I find very nice is that St. Anthony's fire is depicted here. And this is actually the St. Anthony's Hospital in Hieronymus Bosch hometown. Mm -hmm. So he depicted that and then he let it burn down to demonstrate <coughs> this is what you mean when you talk about St. Anthony's fire. So it was very common. Yes? Is this St. Anthony of Padua? Is that no, 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 no. It's no. a different St. Anthony. It's a different St. Anthony. It's, uh, the Brotherhood was formed, uh, the St. Anthony is from the middle of France. Uh, so it has nothing to do okay. with... Um, we have one example of what these hospitals look like. Some of you may have been in Burgundy, in Bonn, where one of these hospitals of the time is still, you can still see this. So this is the idea of what it looked like in this small town in Cornwall. These, whoop, next one, sorry. These brothers were good doctors because they had standard procedures. This is the standard procedure. First of all, you only got into the hospital when you were diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with St. Anthony's fire. If you had another disease, we have very nice letters from 1300. Dear colleagues, um, unfortunately, we admitted yesterday two patients. We thought they had St. Anthony's fire. It turns out it's not. Take them back. <laughs> <laughs> and then therapeutic procedures. Everybody have already well, we watched wound dressing. And then, although they didn't know the cause of the disease, but just by experience, everybody was put on weed. So that, and not why anymore, so taking away the fungus. They gave red wine for vasodilation and also for calming the patients down. And then also very modern meditation in front of the altar during the first night, you know, just to um, get your uh, peace of mind. They treated them with specific herbs. Famous and expensive was their 
cream, Saint Antonine's cream, they sold it expensively. Mm. However, when you we look on the altar, and on the altar you can see it actually, here there's a char, and this is the char, and they sold. So you can see very nice for the patient, they were put in front of the altar, they could look that some people had it worse, <laughs> and at the same time they could see, well, there is something, uh, and the brothers will work on that. But on the same altar, here, we have all these herbs, and I can tell you, it took me uh, some time to translate all this, uh, because these are herbs, uh, so we have lamb's foot here, which is anti-inflammatory, we have ribgrass, buckhorn here, we have cross leaf gentian here, we have long-headed poppy, and this was, these were all ingredients of this cream, which helped to heal uh, the um, extremities. You may also not know that at the time in Strasbourg, there were more than eight different textbooks on pharmacology during that time. So as a student, you could go there and have a choice. It was not only that you buy one book, it was like today. You went to the bookstore and then you looked at the books and you took the one you liked best. And for the organization of the hospital, they didn't have a surgeon, they couldn't afford one. But in Strasbourg, there was a famous surgeon living, Hans von Gerstorf, that's his textbook he wrote at the time, and they hired him, he came two times per uh, week to amputate uh, and to operate on the, the patients, and we know the bills, and uh, so this is how a hospital worked at that time. And I think it's very interesting, coming back to medical students and to seminars, to understand that in 1519, it went, medicine was carried out like this. Now, you are asking about the truck. Well, that's the truck. Um, it's actually, it's a derivative. These are alkaloids. And uh, the person you see here is a famous um, chemist. <coughs> <laughs> Albert Hoffman, he was the uh, uh, senior chemist at uh, Chiba Geige before it became Novartis. And in the 40s, he was working on alkaloids, and uh, this truck was isolated by him in 1942. At the time when you isolated a new truck, you took it yourself. This is what he did. This was on a hot afternoon. He started to make, uh, <laughs> wrote in his diary, I took so and so much. He took quite a bit. <laughs> and then he went, uh, and went home on his bike. Uh, and uh, when you're in San Francisco, you can still buy t-shirts uh, with a bike ride. Uh, because this was the first bike ride after LSD. <laughs> and then he came home. Uh, he came back to the lab the next day. Uh, his technician was very worried about him. And uh, then he started to work on these drugs. And Albert Hoffman uh, had a wonderful, beautiful house and garden. He collected butterflies. He had a lot of friends. And he was allowed by the uh, Swiss government on his birthday, uh, when his friends were invited for dessert, the doors were closed and everybody got LSD. <laughs> this was very official. <laughs> and you can see, I think he's the only Swiss chemist who actually made it to fame. And this is he standing with Timothy Leary. <laughs> now let's go from uh, southern Germany to Florence. And this is where we think painting came, came from. I think I've convinced you that painting actually trickled down to Florence. And it was really like this because the uh, Florentines, the Medici at the time, what they had is they had money and they bought culture, like always. And they bought it from Burgundy. And they bought all these altars there. And when you go to the Uffizi, you can see very famous altars which were painted in the noise and then transported. And they learned quickly. And um, this is the painting we will talk about. This is um, now in the National Gallery in London. It's called Allegory of Love. 
And uh, when you go to London, you can buy mugs, you can buy posters, you <laughs> buy scars, whatever you want to, with this wonderful painting, which I find a little bit shocking, you know, because uh, for those of you who had some classical training, this is actually son and mother. Uh, and uh, so this is allegory of love. We have here these uh, turtles. Uh, but then you can also see, and we'll come to this in a moment, we have a very smooth surface here, but behind that, well, it's a bit different. The painting was ordered by Cosimo de Medici. This is the second generation. This is the second generation of the Medici, uh, Medici. That's his wife. So these are not the original ones like Lorenzo and the Renaissance, uh, Renaissance people. They are the dukes of. Uh, uh, Florence, uh, and uh, they were not living downtown, they were living in uh, the Palazzo Pitti and the Bovoli Gardens, so that's what I said, the other Medici. The painting was actually made for political reasons, because um, the Medici wanted to give it to uh, François the Premier, Fr uh, Fr uh, Fr uh, Fr <laughs> François the First, uh, who was a Renaissance prince, as uh, he liked paintings. There's his Fontainebleau, his castle, you can see here. And these are the paintings he hung in his bathroom. So, Allegory of Love was originally made for the bathroom of <laughs> François Le Premier. Uh, quite successful, it was delivered, uh, he liked it. Now, the question is, what do we see here? And what does it have to do with disease? Now, I already alluded to that uh, this person is not looking ha happy uh, at all. I mean, they are happy. <laughs> this uh, young kid here is happy, throwing roses. Uh, this girl here, well, she doesn't look happy. And when you look more carefully, she has honeycombs here, so it's sweet. But when you look at them more carefully, the hands are somewhat distorted. And then you have here, somebody is also not happy, more like a mask, and you have masks here. And uh, when you go down here, there is a nice dress. But then all of a sudden, the feet are not really you want to go out with, with for a date. <laughs> so, <laughs> this means we have one surface, which is all smooth, great, wonderful, I mean, you are really thrilled, this is what love can be, and then you have behind that another layer, and this person here is actually unveiling this, and this is Father Time. <laughs> so, why disease? What is the bad side of love? Some of you may remember the 80s. Was that the bad side of love in the 80s? Yes. HIV. Yeah. Was there a bad side of love in 1539? Yes. Hmm? Yes. We'll come to this in a moment. So we look at that. So you see this young man here? <laughs> And then you follow his feet, because they go from the first layer to the second. They are a little bit distorted here, the same as this feet here. They are not really um, now forward, but uh, they look a little bit. And when we enlarge this, you can see this here. Here we have blood. And then you enlarge it more. This is the first example of uh, athlete's foot in Renaissance. <laughs> and when you compare it actually to textbooks, not bad. <laughs> so what we have here is really uh, something which we would call a uh, disease lag uh, with blood change. And so we have in one person Somebody throwing roses and at the same time having problems. And yes, this is syphilis. Do you know if syphilis first occurred? This was 1492. Uh, it was uh, in Naples. 
the Spanish uh, had troops there, and all of a sudden a disease broke out, which killed a lot of soldiers. Which is very interesting because it tells us you can see this here, and you had all these skin alterations, and you died from it. These days, you don't, you don't die from syphilis because it's a more chronic disease, but at that time, it tells you that the bacterium has changed over time, or our response to the bacterium has changed over time, and then it's spread. And this is shown here, <coughs> and books were written. This is 1498, this is five years after the disease was first observed in Naples, and this book deals with a new disease which was first described in Naples, Italy. It is called French disease. The French call it Spanish disease. <laughs> Italian disease. Because the disease is rapidly spreading in all countries. Patients suffer from acute and chronic pain. It lasts eight to ten months with generalized affection of the skin, which resembles, is, in, in, is associated with alteration and foul odors. Now, who had syphilis at the time? It was a traumatic disease. It changed everything. In Germany, before that, uh, bathhouses, you know, saunas, were all the way. I mean, people went there, you spent the whole day there, uh, you read, you enjoyed music, uh, you met other people, obviously, they were closed down. <laughs> After 1510, no open houses, no saunas, so it's very comparable. These are um, two popes. Unfortunately, this is German, I'm sorry about that. This is uh, Julius II, and we'll come back to this person in a moment, and also Leo X. Both of them suffered from syphilis. But it says here in German, this guy, famous pope, couldn't get up after mass because his feet were so swollen that he was it was lots of ulcers and he died also from syphilis. So it was not only contagious, a lot of people were affected. When you look at the publications uh, during the first 10 years, all over Europe, there were books written about the disease, doctors were trained, we tried, they tried to understand uh, where the disease comes from. Uh, so a lot of science, a lot of scientific literature on syphilis and the doctor who first coined the name is painted here by Titian. This is a painting also in the National Gallery in London. So when you go there next time, I mean, you can leave an impression because you go from this one painting allegory of love and you say, well, come with me. We go into <laughs> three rooms further. And this is the guy who actually described this disease, which we have just seen on this <laughs> baby. He was famous. He uh, then served the Pope. And he actually almost got it that this was a contagious disease and was distributed by something. No idea about bacteria, uh, but, uh, and as I said, he coined the disease and then he was very successful. His books, his works were uh, published all over Europe. These are all the translations. Uh, and his name is Fracastorius. <laughs> And then, as today, as of today, there were cures for it. And there were two competing cures of it. Cures of it. One was uh, mercury. And here you see in one of these, they have the disease and they are treated here with a paste where mercury is in it. And you had a choice, either your teeth were falling out from mercury, but perhaps you would survive the syphilis, or you died from syphilis. So it was about the choice. And then there was a second treatment, which is Goyag Brut, which actually comes also from South America. And you know that the story is that syphilis was imported from South America by the Spanish, and then it was distributed from uh, the port of Cadiz to Naples. And just to finish this, it was also about patents in these days. So the Fugger family bought the patent for Goya Wood from Charles V. They paid a lot of money. 
actually they paid the whole coronation thing and they paid uh, the elections and without their money he would have, wouldn't have been elected anyway and then afterwards they came and then the question was you know how do they pay back and this was part of the payback but the focus did then as of today they um, prohibited printing of the other methods <laughs> so whenever they had a share in a printing company they said if you print something about mercury you know so they pushed very much for Guyak, uh, which was not very helpful. Mercury wasn't very helpful either, but I think it's uh, very interesting to see this. And one would have thought, you know, that this uh, painting, Allegory of Love, uh, has so much content and so much history during that time. I'm using up here my time. We have only so far a couple of patients and um, I'll try to be a, a, bit, a bit more faster. This is another Italian. This is Raphael. That's uh, the last painting of Raphael and Richard Parks and I, we talked about this on Saturday and he said, I have a print of that uh, in my, my staircase. And I said, well, then I have to include this into the lecture. And this is Transfiguration of Christ. This is a painting where 300 years later, Johann Wolfgang from Goethe, when he was in Rome, he went there, he said, well, it was worth the trip. We can't really, you know, associate because we have seen so many things, but this was a very famous painting, and I'll come to this in a moment. So what we see here is Christ ascending to heaven, and down here we have his disciples, and then we have this lady, we don't know really what that is, where she comes from. And then we have here this crew. There is a father and the father is holding his son. And the son definitely is not well. Now medical students have to describe this. And when they describe it, it's obvious what this child has. You know, the child is almost falling. When you look at the eyes, so that you can see this in front, the eyes are upwards, they are whitish, so the pupils are, you can't see them. <laughs> the arms are stretched like this, the fingers are stretched like this. This is chromal epilepsy. <laughs> and the diagnosis was made here in the first uh, row already. That's a classic <laughs> description of the disease. You can see that... Uh, Raphael took some time. He's an excellent painter. So and this is one of the drawings he made before that. And here you can see even more clearly that we have a Raphael painting with chromal epilepsy. And I have to admit, this is not my invention, but my teacher, when I was studying medicine in the 70s in Berlin, uh, Professor Jans, he actually, when he retired, he wrote another thesis just on this painting, a whole book, because he was one of the specialists on epilepsy uh, in Germany. Now, this disease had always been associated with the moon. Now, is there a moon in this painting? You can't see that, but there is a moon. The moon is reflected here. So a very tiny moon, and at the same time, it has a political meaning. Because what is a half moon associated with today and at the time is Islam. So this was not only a sign that this patient, this moon struck, but at that time, there were Islam corsairs in front of Rome trying really to throw over Rome, and they had captured uh, its ends uh, 100 years before, actually 60 years before. So this is a disease which is bad on different levels. And then the painting was ordered by this pope. That's Leo X from the Medici family. Now what does Medici mean? Medici is Medicus. 
So when you order the painting, it has also the meaning me, Leo the Tenth. I am the medical. I can I can hear all that. I'm almost when you go back to the painting. I'm almost like <coughs> Jesus Christ who was actually healing this. You know, here you can see this is the source which can heal the disease. And then at the same time, this is the source, Christianity, which can <coughs> save us from <coughs> the deadly influence of the half moon. And me, the Pope, me, the Medici Pope, <laughs> I'm uh, responsible for that. I'm Protestant. I never can my mind uh, about uh, whether I like the Medici Pope because he was responsible for a lot of paintings. I like Raphael a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know that Martin Luther was in Rome at the same time. He hated his guts. I mean, he thought that he was spending all the money and this is how Reformation started in, in the 1520s. So it's very difficult to make a decision. Last but not least, the painting was ordered for the church of Medici, the Medici Pope. He was not Pope at the time. He just became in 1520 Pope. Uh, the painting was ordered for a church in Narbonne and uh, where he was the bishop of. And uh, at the time, as of today, he ordered two paintings uh, just for competition. So this is Raphael. And Raphael at the time, uh, he was born in 1492. This is 1518. He was 27, 28 years old. He was the superstar of Rome. He was the architect for the Vatican. He was painting, he was given a lot of money. When you ordered from Raphael, I mean, he could ask every price he wanted to. And then he was given the job of painting this. And at the same time, Sebastiano de Biombo, who was a pupil of Michelangelo, was given the task of doing also a painting for the same church. And then Raphael died. This is like one of the Rolling Stones, right? You know, I mean, this is <laughs> this is how he become famous. I mean, he died about a week before the painting was finished, and then the two paintings were displayed next to each other in the Vatican, and more than twenty thousand people came and watched it. And who do you think won? So that far, I mean, this painting disappeared. This painting is also in the National Gallery in London these days. And this is in the Vatican Museum. Very hard to find because you have to go through about one million Madonnas before you actually <laughs> <laughs> Almost last, we stay in Rome. That's the Vatican. That's the church. This is the palace where the Pope lives. That's the garden of the Pope. This here is the Sistine Chapel. So when Raphael came first to Rome, this was uh, at a very early age, just about 20, he came from Florence. He was already a little bit famous. He was given the job to decorate the private quarters of Julius II. That's the Pope we were just talking about. And Raphael uh, should paint four rooms. They are called the Stanze in the Vatican. So he started with these frescoes, and this is a very famous one. It's called the School of Athens. And we can see here a little bit larger. <coughs> and this is for the first time a realistic painting, or what he thought is a realistic painting of all the philosophers. You can see here Aristotle, Aristoteles, you can see here Platon. And when you go and we don't do this, when you go with a guide there, they tell you, and some, sometimes you know, sometimes you don't. But here you see, for instance, Pythagoras, <coughs> and here you see others. So it's a whole assembly of philosophers, and this is why it's called the School of Athens. And we know from drawings uh, that uh, this took him about uh, six months to do. And then he added this person here. So this was not originally planned. So who is this man? And is there a problem 
this disease. And yes, there is. When you look at these knees, these knees are not normal. And people think that this is Michelangelo. Now, why did he add Michelangelo? You know, all the others, they are from Athens. They are Greek philosophers. Um, one of them here, one of my heroes in Roman history, <laughs> is actually a cardinal of the Lateran, a very gifted person, uh, a little bit fat. When you go to the uh, Elizabeth Garden Museum in Boston, you can see a Raphael painting of this person, a very uh, wonderful portrait. Uh, so why Michelangelo? Well, Michelangelo was painting at the same time while Raphael was doing the stanza about less than a hundred meters away, the Sistine Chapel. They didn't like each other. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, Michelangelo was already more famous. I mean, Raphael was very young. So it was actually, what Michelangelo did is he chopped the door so that Raphael couldn't see him painting this. And Raphael paid this back, and I'll come to this in a moment. So the question is, what are these knees? And the knees could be either arthrosis, it could be gout, or it could be thrombosis. When you look at that, uh, this is what arthrosis would... Uh, gout is very unlikely because we have diaries from Michelangelo, and he never suffered from renal disease or from other problems of gout. Uh, so I think that's out of the uh, uh, equation, but from those it could be all arthrosis. Why should he have at that age, he wasn't that old, arthrosis? Because he was doing this. <laughs> he was painting this ceiling. You know how he did this? It was a piece of art. He first had, we can still see this, you know, he put in uh, all the uh, woodwork uh, in there, he made holes in there, and then he complained bitterly for the next couple of years. And here we see, uh, this is by Michelangelo, and I won't, I'm not going to read out this poem in, Ita in Italian to you, but what it says is, this is a terrible job, you know. <laughs> it's tripping into my, uh, into my eyes. Uh, I am sore all over. Why I'm doing this? He was running away from the job two times and they had to track him back in order to finish that. So I think it could be either arthrosis or uh, uh, chronic venous insufficiency. You can see, no, you can see what this looks like when you have serious thrombosis, so uh, this is absolutely comparable. This is um, uh, doubt, so that's possible, but as I said before, so why did he paint him when they didn't like each other? When you look more closely, I mean, first of all, he is badly dressed. And Michelangelo was known for that. Raphael was more elegant. Well, I finished with Leonardo da Vinci, he was also more elegant. I mean, he was just, he liked dressing and uh, Michelangelo didn't care. So he paints him here sitting with these awful shoes, leather shoes. <laughs> he sits there, he's brooding because he's not in a good mood. And what is this next to him? That's a marble block. So what actually Raphael is telling here, Michelangelo and the world, do me a favor, I mean, stop painting. <laughs> Stick with your damn marble blocks, you know, I mean, do sculpture. Or, if you can't help it, he's writing there, he was also known for writing poems. Not very good poems, but he liked writing poems in his terrible knees, sitting there, and Raphael tells us, you know, stick with marble, and we have to admit, he did a wonderful job. That was his first piece he did in Rome when he arrived, Michelangelo did. So, like I said, Raphael says, well, stick with that and leave me alone. <laughs> but instead he did this, and you know that uh, he did first the ceiling, and then 
more than 30 years later, this year. So this was not done at the same time, a different life. And I'll finish with that. Some of you may have seen this before because I gave a lecture, I, I think, about 10 years ago at the SCQM. And this is the best, well, it's not the best, but this is the most famous. Now here we don't, do not have a problem because you can see it here better than you can see it in the Louvre. Because when you go to the Louvre, you can't see anything at all. I mean, very distant, lots of people in front of you and lots of glass or plastic in front of you. So that's Mona Lisa. Disease? Well, she has a yellowish face. I mean, she could have hepatitis, but as I said, this is out. We don't use colors. Mm -hmm. So, when we look more closely, you may recognize, and you can't see this from far away, that here she has something in the corner of her eye. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not by chance. In fact, Leonardo didn't do anything by chance. You know how long he painted on this? I mean, he, he was a weird guy. He was given, uh, the husband of Mona Lisa asked him, a merchant in Florence, to paint his wife. That's the most likely person. So he painted her, and then he took the painting with her. And then he painted on it for the next 15 years. And he ended up in the Louvre because when he died, he died in France uh, in 1521, and he still had the painting in his house. Mm -hmm. So he gave it to the king of France then, and this is why it's in, in France. And the Italians always wanted it back. You may be aware that an Italian stole it uh, in 1912 <laughs> from the Louvre, and uh, ironically, Picasso because he was a poor painter in Paris, the police called him in and said, you know, you have been to the Louvre, uh, perhaps you have stolen it. it. Took them almost uh, a year before they found it again. So she has something here uh, in the corner of her eye. And if you enlarge this a little bit, you can see this here more clearly. And when we enlarge it a little bit more, she has something here, what the clini a clinician would call axantilasma. It may be a word, but it looks, especially when it's located here, it's a cholesterol deposition. When you compare this with the textbooks, so Mona Lisa has a cholesterol deposition, which means she has hypercholesterolemia. You wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> but it gets even more complicated. Because when you look at her hands, anything you can see there? There is this little thing here. Other things? Well, actually, a student about two years ago, she said, Dr. Harrow, I think that the hands are a little bit puffy. Yes. So all of a sudden, we have hypercholesterolemia, and we have puffy hands, and we have this swelling here. The swelling may, may be a lipoma, so uh, this is also lipid accumulation, but then since it's not high cholesterol, I don't think it has anything to do with that, but there is still the swelling of the hand. And when you look at other paintings by Leonardo, this is about the same time, you can see he was all for bony hands. <laughs> this young lady, that's a wonderful painting, which is in Poland, in Krakow, she was the lover of the Duke of Milan, and she was well known for her beauty and that she was lovely and everything. And the hands are, well, they are traumatic. Uh, so I think when you compare these two, she has puffy hands, which means she has edema. And now the nephrologist in the back of the room, I mean, you have a patient with hypercholesterolemia and a patient with puffy fingers, and then you look more and more, and you think, well, the, the face is a little bit puffy as well, you know. Might be not a lot of edema, but uh, I always thought, you know, that she was not as beautiful as she, but uh, she's, one is from Milan, she has, the other is from Florence. So. 
So now we have Mona Lisa with Alexander Lasma, Libra Huma, stolen fingers, and here wonderful for the nephrologist. There are mostly two diagnoses. It's either hyperthyroidism, which could be, you know, she looks a little bit like that. Also, the eyebrows. We have not talked about the eyebrows, but they are missing, which at the time could have been beauty, but uh, or it is a kidney disease associated with protein mm -hmm. yep. And here, MDIVR comes in because we have a model here. We could have <laughs> the Mona Lisa team and using our secret. With that, I'd like to end, and uh, these are some of the paintings. There are more you can see here. The world is full of diseases on different paintings. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, no, not really. And the question is, do, did the painters talk to the physician? To be honest, at that time, physicians made diagnosis not by watching the patient. They were listening to the complaints of the patient, and then they made a diagnosis, and looking at patients was not really uh, that traumatic. Nonetheless, when the patient was suffering, they looked at that, so there may have been some exchange, but mostly it was about the realism. The, the big invention of the 14th century is that realistic painting is worth something. So the more realistic it was, the better it was uh, paid for. Even if you were painting your work. Well, uh, that's a good question. You know, I mean, the question is, uh, so if realism is uh, so important, uh, what happens if you go to a painter and ask for your portrait? That's always a difficult question because on the one hand, you want it to be as similar as possible. I mean, you want to, you will, you want to be able to recognize yourself when it's hanging, hanging in your living room. On the other hand, it should be a little bit more positive than <laughs> what you think <laughs> of yourself. <laughs> However, it depends on the person, because some of us may not think it should be better, it should be more realistic. So what do you do uh, if the painter is actually able to depict something of your inner character in your portrait, you know, you like, like this person. Uh, some of you may know a very, um, actually the terrible story um, of uh, Vincent Churchill. Uh, the British Parliament was given him uh, a portrait, and uh, he was painted uh, by uh, Sutherland. And the painting was very much Churchill. It's, I mean, I, I think it's a terrible idea to paint Churchill in 1953, you know, after defeat, uh, Second World War, defeat, and then back as being Prime Minister, and then you have your own portrait. Well, he hated it. What actually happened is, he didn't do it, but it was taken home, and then his wife burned it in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question about portrait is, yes, realism, but it should be, well, you should like <laughs> The master, the master, I mean, we know some of them, you know, like Rembrandt, uh, just wonderful. Yes. Why did in the uh, the art you were showing related to syphilis? Why did the artist give a child syphilis? That seems really strange. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's a very good question. It's also the question why we never published a blog we wrote here because the um, the sexuality which is displayed there today is really more difficult. I mean, it's obviously that the young man. Uh, has uh, uh, is appealing to gay people as well. The young boy there may be part of whatever uh, 
sexual things happened at the time. So I think uh, that's part of it. You know, throwing roses, being young, and then at the same time afflicted with a disease like that. Yes. Uh, uh, medical students with art is wonderful. Uh, with the teacher such as you, who is all about, uh, is all about observations of what they see. My question is, can medical students learn as much from x-rays of the chest being formed by a top-notch dermatologist, uh, radiologist, who sees many things, such as the characteristics of, of bone as they do from, from, uh, from observing art from museums, such as you, well, uh, Herman, you're an MD who is also an art historian. But I know because I was responsible for funding the student uh, who went to go with a medical doctor uh, named Herman Herman who was a dermatologist who started the course at Yale. Uh, yeah. and uh, to see the uh, art museum uh, and, and I have to decide whether to fund the student or not fund the student. <laughs> what did you do? Yeah. You said, you know, this is all rubbish. I mean, you just yeah. you just stay, stay at the medical school and then don't go down the road to the museum. It's set it up so that the student would observe art mm -hmm. as it occurs control group was half of the class who would get a free meal, free meal, and be tested on their skill of the observation. I, I encourage them uh, to have a lecture from a famous, famous radiologist named Ann Curtis, who is uh, used x-rays in the chest uh, to see teach students about observations. Well, it's the same the results of the test were uh, equal. Yeah, thank you very much, John. I, I think basically it's the same. You know, when you have a good teacher and you have a radiology picture hanging there, what you do is you look at it and then you describe it. Yeah. And then you look at the bones, and then you look whether you see something which is irregular, yes. and uh, you have certain rules. This is exactly what you do when you look at a painting. And then when you have found something which is irregular or not explainable, then you need advice, and somebody has to teach you, you know, what, what's wrong there. But you always start by looking at it. Yeah. And don't make this mistake, uh, <laughs> they just did that you look at it and say, well, that's it. If you haven't looked more carefully and you haven't looked at, uh, the ribs and all these things and you, it, you don't take a little bit of time for that, you are ending up with the wrong diagnosis. Wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.